All right, we're, we're coming towards the end, so somebody would mind turning those lights down. Um, it, as Ray said, a, a lot of you may be coming back to the farm and or you may have purchased a new farm and, and you're at a point that you've got to try to figure out how to bring these pastures back into good shape and, um, and, and improve those. And that's kind of what this talk focuses on, is kind of getting the fundamentals down for, for really bringing those pastures back to a productive state. And um, so the title is Re Rejuvenating Rundown Pastures, an Integrated Approach to st Restoring Pasture Productivity. And, and I will mention my email's on there, and, and you're welcome to call us anytime. We always encourage you to go through your extension agent, though, if you can. Um, we've got some great extension agents throughout the state, and, uh, and we like to work through our extension agents if, if possible. All right, so the first question I always ask is how, how did you get where you're at? You know, why, why do you lose stands? And there's lots of different reasons too much or too little water. Maybe you have poor fertility or, or really low soil pH. Poor grazing management, poor mowing management if you're in a hay field or, or, um, or a dual use area. Poor choice of forage species. We kind of talked about that yesterday, right? You can plant whatever you want, but, but really if you want something to be persistent, it's got to be adapted to where you're trying to grow it at. And then we've got weeds, and, and we often talk about weeds taking the pasture over, and, and I've got a question mark behind that, because often weeds are a symptom of an underlying problem. And that problem may be grazing management, it may be fertility, but somehow there's a hole in that pasture. And, and the good Lord doesn't leave a piece of bare soil on a pasture very long. Something's going to grow there. And in, in many cases, it's a weed. And then we have intermittent problems with uh, insects like fall army worm and, and then diseases in some of our forage species, especially the ones that are a little marginally adapted. So the, the point that I want to make from this is that it's, it's usually just not one of these. Often we say this, the drought killed my pasture. Yeah, maybe, but it was kind of like the, the straw that broke the camel's back. So I've had years of poor grazing management in my pasture. And, and then um, I've got poor soil fertility, so, and then a drought comes along and, and my pasture dies. Well, the, the drought was kind of the thing that killed the pasture, but really what set it up for that death was the poor management prior to that drought. In most cases, drought is not going to kill a well-managed cool season pasture in this region of the country if it's well-managed going into that drought. The first thing we always think about when we talk about pasture renovation is reseeding that pasture, and that's really kind of on the bottom of my list. There's lots of steps that we need to take before we get to that point where we're actually going in and, and reestablishing that pasture. So this is kind of the integrated approach to pasture renovation, and um, it starts with soil fertility. If, if we don't have a base level of soil fertility in our pastures, it's really hard to have a good, strong, and vigorous sod. And, and Mr. Hall just talked about that, how important that fertility is. And that, that takes time to build up. It's, it's not something that just happens overnight. And then we want to choose well-adapted forages for our grazing system. And when I say well-adapted, I mean it's got to be regionally adapted, but also adapted to the specific soils on your farm. Just because Mr. Hall can grow alfalfa doesn't mean you can grow alfalfa on your farm. You may not have the soils that will support alfalfa. Um, and then we've got to look at grazing management. How can we improve grazing management as part of our renovation program? And then talk about overseeding legumes. And, and that example of frost seeding red clover into your pastures is, is an outstanding example for overseeding legumes into your pastures. Legumes are an important part of grazing systems. Um, and then on the bottom of my list is, is going in and doing a complete renovation. And, um, and, and usually that would be um, the last thing that I would want to do. But if you don't correct everything else first, your soil fertility and your grazing management, um, it's going to be really hard for you to reseed something and then have success with it. So let's start off with uh, soil fertility. And I always like to kind of define what a soil is. You know, if you've ever had a soils class, what do we talk about with soils? We say, well, they're, 
They're made up of sand, silt, and clay. And then we measure chemical things in them, right? But really, a soil is a dynamic natural body composed of mineral or, and organic solid gases, liquids, and living organisms. We don't talk enough about the living organisms in soil. And, uh, and all those things together serve as a, a growth medium for plants. If we look at an acre of healthy pasture, what we find, if we look at below the ground, we've got about seven tons of living things per acre. And it's important to remember that we don't only manage the, the animal and the plant, but we're managing this whole kind of soil ecosystem underneath the soil. So we've got roots, we've got 2,500 pounds of roots, we've got uh, close to um, two tons of bacteria and antinomycetes, we've got 6,000 pounds of fungi. So now think about this for a minute. These are things that are microscopic and we've got 6,000 pounds of fungi per acre. And, and when we add all this up, it's about seven, seven tons of living things per acre. So we need to think about this and how we can enhance this kind of um, uh, microbes and, and improve the soil in terms of the life that's living there. And it always, I find it interesting, there's 625 pounds of worms per acre. That's pretty amazing to me. So this is not a presentation on the pasture ecology. If you want to see a presentation on pasture ecology, come to our, our winter grazing conference. We've got Dr. Ed Rayburn, who's going to talk about all these things that live in the soil and how they interact in the soil food web. Okay, whenever I start to talk about soil fertility, I like to talk about a basic principle. It's called Liebig's Law of the Minimum. And, and all it says is that whatever um, the level of plant production can be no greater than whatever the most limiting nutrient is or limiting essential plant growth factor. And there's lots of different essential plant growth factors. There's nutrients like potassium and nitrogen and phosphorus. There's soil acidity can limit plant growth. Soil moisture, if it's real dry, we're going to limit plant growth. Temperature, and the list goes on and on and on. What Liebig's Law says is whatever the most limiting is, is going to hold back overall pasture production. What, why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because when we start to think about a soil fertility program for our pastures, we need to be thinking about it from a balanced approach. We can't pick and choose only to supply nitrogen or only to supply potassium or only lime our pastures. We've got to have that balanced approach because if we don't supply what's limiting, we're going to hold overall pasture production back. So one of the most beautiful things about ruminant livestock systems is, is the strong nutrient cycle that we can develop in our pastures. And what the nutrient cycle is, is that means that nutrients are, instead of being removed from the field, like with hay production or row crop production, they're actually cycled around within this grassland ecosystem. So if we look at a cow-calf system, we'll have inputs come into this system. And the inputs come in in terms of uh, nutrient-wise and fertilizer, any manure that we have on the pastures, nitrogen that the legumes are fixing from the air into a plant available form. Anything that we feed, hay, mineral supplement, supplemental feed, all bringing nutrients into this grazing system. And then they get cycled through this system. And the animal is an important part of this nutrient cycle. So it's going to eat the forage that's being produced in that pasture. In about 80 to 90 percent of the nutrients that go in the front end of the animal comes out the back end of the animal. So it's up to us to manage those nutrients. We talked a little bit about that um, yesterday and manage this nutrient cycle. And then if we look at the exports from this system in a cow calf system, essentially our export is these calves. If we look at some data from the University of Missouri, we remove very little nutrients with a cow-calf pair. We've got 10 pounds of nitrogen, seven pounds of phosphate or P2O5, and about one pound of K2O. So very small quantity of nutrients are removed from this system. They're recycled within this system. And that's the beauty of a cow-calf production system. Once we build our fertility up in that system, then we cycle those nutrients around and we have very low um, nutrient removal. What can happen is that we can get a redistribution of nutrients in our our grazing system. So in this diagram, we've got one big pasture boundary. And animals will go out and they'll graze here, and then they'll come back where? Water. To shade and water, that's right. So 
uh, and they'll go there and they'll lay down and they'll ruminate. And, and what happens when they get back up to go graze again? They make a deposit, right? And, and over time, we build nutrients up. So they transport nutrients from out in the pasture and concentrate them around any areas where they congregate at. Hay feeding areas, shade areas, water areas, uh, mineral feeders, and so forth. Um, so what do we do about that in the grazing system? The what? It, very good. So, so that's exactly what we do. We would subdivide and rotate. So, so we put the animals out here in, in this paddock, and we say, well, go ahead and eat that grass, but you've got to leave those nutrients in that paddock. And then we move to the next one and so on. And that's going to give us a much more uniform nutrient distribution within our grazing system. And that's one of the benefits of rotational stocking that we don't talk enough about. Ray talked a lot about the impact on the plant, the positive impact on the plant and the productivity of those pastures. But we also improve the nutrient cycling within that system by rotating those pastures. Now, in contrast, when we look at hay production, these are nutrients removed by hay. So if we take a look at, for example, orchard grass, orchard grass removes about 50 pounds of nitrogen, 17 pounds of, of uh, phosphate, and about 60 pounds of um, potash per acre. Now, say we had a good year for uh, orchard grass hay production. We got three tons of hay per acre. All of a sudden, we're removing 150 pounds of uh, nitrogen. We're removing... Um, about 50 pounds of um, phosphate and about 180 pounds of potash per acre. Now we can go on a couple years and not fertilize that hay field, but over time we're going to draw those levels down. And we, we commonly see that, can you guys hear okay? We commonly see that happen in hay production fields. Over time, when people don't fertilize it and replace the nutrients, we draw those nutrient levels down and the productivity of that field decreases over time. So let, let's take a quick look at the value of the nutrients in, in a ton of hay. So if we assume that these are the levels, one ton of hay has 45 pounds of nitrogen, 15 pounds of phosphorus, 55 pounds of potash. We assume some prices here. Um, as most of you know, if you bought any fertilizer lately, they're pretty high right now. So we've got 52 uh, cents for nitrogen, 32 for phosphate, and 54 for potash. One ton of hay is going to remove about $58, or is going to have about $58 worth of nutrients in a ton of hay. So the interesting thing is you can go on Facebook Marketplace and, <laughs> and buy a roll of hay for you know $20 or $30 sometimes. And now I'm not saying it's great quality hay. Well, you never see anybody put anything on there that doesn't say good quality hay, right? Mixed grass hay, good quality. Nobody's going to put on there and say, I got some really crappy hay I'd love to sell you. But um, the point is, is that there's a tremendous amount of nutrients in hay. And it, it's up to us to kind of bring those, use that to our advantage. And we can use hay to move nutrients from with outside of our grazing system into it and, and then cycle nutrients around within our grazing system. So um, how do we do that? We make the most out of those nutrients in hay by not feeding that hay in one spot. And, and Greg talked a little bit about that with bale grazing. The, the point that I want to make is that we can move our feeding spots around within a pasture. So we can use a bale wagon or we can just set hay out here and there within the pasture or roll it out. Any way we can move those feeding points around, we're going to get a better nutrient distribution within our grazing system from the nutrients in that hay, and they're going to be more valuable to us. Um, we always want to feed hay on our porous pastures, um, and then we want to move those feeding points around. And we can use hay that we buy to bring nutrients into our grazing system. And then we can even move nutrients around within our grazing system. So if I was on an old dairy, where would most of my nutrients be? That's right, around the barn where the animals were. So I can produce hay there if I have high levels of phosphorus and potassium. And I can move it to the back of the farm and feed it on the hill slopes in the wintertime and then transfer those nutrients from one part of the farm to the other. So whenever we talk about soil fertility, it all, all starts with the soil test. And this is where your local extension agents can really help you out here. Um, 
So this quantifies phosphorus and potassium, but not nitrogen. Nitrogen is a very transient nutrient in the soil, so we don't measure that. We apply that to get a certain yield goal. It also provides us a soil pH, and we'll talk about that in a minute. If we don't soil test, we're just kind of guessing what to put on, and this is a really bad time with high fertilizer prices to be guessing what to put on. We want to put on exactly what we need to put on and not any more than we need to. And it, so in it, that's one of the reasons that soil testing is really important when it's so high, because we can target those applications. And then we want to keep track of our fertility levels by sampling every two to three years. And, and um, we were going to talk, we were actually going to let you guys take some soil samples yesterday, but it was raining too hard. Um, but getting a good sample is absolutely critical because it's representing um, 2 million pounds of soil per acre, a little handful of soil that we're sending into the lab. So taking the time and getting a good sample is absolutely critical. We want that sample to be representative of what we're looking at. We want at least 20 cores per sample. We want to sample each um, pasture individually, and we want the pastures to be 20 acres. If they're more than 20 acres, then we'll divide that pasture in half and take two samples. The proper depth it was interesting. I was at a pasture walk about two weeks ago, and so we were walking around, and, um, and I let the group take a soil sample as we're walking around. And I said, what depth should we be soil sampling at? The answers range from one inch to a foot and a half. You know, the right answer is four inches. We need to be sampling for pastures at about four inches. And um, we want to avoid atypical areas when we're sampling. So what's an atypical area? Areas where animals congregate at. Water areas, feed areas where we fed hay at. Those kind of areas, shade areas, we want to stay away from those areas because they're going to give us an elevated soil test level because there's a lot of nutrients that get concentrated there. And then we want to make sure that we uh, mix the sample up, fill the bag, and do our paperwork. Uh, the paperwork's important because we want to make sure that we get the recommendation that we need for that particular field. And that's where your extension agents can help you fill that out and make sure that you've uh, got the proper crop down. And then you'll get a report back like this. And the first thing I always look at is the pH, and I've got it highlighted here. That tells us a lot, and I'm, I'm going to talk, spend just a couple slides talking about soil pH. Um, soil acidity is a major factor limiting uh, forage production in the southeastern United States, and it's doing a couple things. One, it's reducing, um, it's reducing the availability of different nutrients in the soil. So if I have a pH that's too low, all the nutrients in the soil become less available to the plant. It's also reducing nitrogen fixation in our legumes, so we want to make sure that we have our soil pH right. Liming neutralizes soil acidity and supplies calcium and magnesium to the soil. And then these are some general guidelines. In general, we want to be down here in this, this range of 6 to 6.4. Now, if we're like Mr. Hall and we're growing alfalfa, then we need to be shooting for 6.8 as the initial soil pH to start to grow alfalfa. Um, but generally 6 to 6.4 for a grass clover mix. So this is a, a, a diagram of the impact of soil pH on nutrient availability. Over on this side we have a pH of 4, very acidic. Over here a 10, very alkaline. Where we want to be in the middle is right here between 6 and 7. And when we look at 6 and 7, each one of these bands represents a different nutrient. The fatter the band is, the wider the band is, the more plant available that nutrient is. So when we look right here, all of our primary nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, calcium, magnesium, sulfur, um, are all going to be the most plant available we're in that, when we're in that range of 6 to 7. So that's one of the reasons that we want to apply lime to our pastures. If you have limited fund, and the funds, and I know everybody in here does, if your soil test calls for lime, then you need to spend that money on lime. That's the first thing you should apply to your pasture. Because that's not only going to neutralize soil acidity, but it's going to make all these other nutrients in the soil more plant available. Okay, so here's a, a ton and a half is a, a recommendation on this particular soil test. Then we go up here and take a look at phosphorus, potassium. Um, and they're both in the medium test range, and that's not bad on this particular soil test. 
And we'll talk a little bit more about what these ranges mean in a minute. So um, if we're in a very low or low soil test range, that means that that nutrient's deficient and there's really, we really expect to get a yield response to that nutrient when we apply fertilizer. And our fertilizer application is going to be based on not only supplying the immediate needs of the plants, but also building up um, that soil over time. Medium, we may get a nutrient, I mean, we, the nutrient may be deficient, um, but, but, and that means we may get a yield response, but not always. Generally speaking, if fertilizer prices are high and you're in that medium soil test range, then you should probably hold off till they come back down. And we're going to get a maintenance plus build up application. Now, if we're in a high range, the nutrient is not deficient and we're not normally going to get any yield response. So we only put on what we're taking away or what we may be losing from the system. If we're in a very high range, the nutrient's not deficient. Um, we're not going to get a yield response and we're not going to have any fertilizer recommendation at all. And this is kind of this response here. So when we're in a low and very low range, that yield response shown on the y-axis um, is going to be very steep when we apply the needed nutrient. Now as we get into this medium range, it really tails off, and by the time we reach the high range, that yield response is, is pretty much level. So Really, if we're in this low or very low range is when we're going to get our biggest response to added fertilizer. Um, once we're in this medium range, you know, this is the ideal spot, we're teetering right between medium and high. But really, if we're in this medium range, we're going to be doing pretty good and we're not going to be restricting yield too much with soil fertility in our pastures. And then we get recommendations here on the bottom. And, and these recommendations that are provided are based on the information that you put on your soil test form when you turned that soil sample in. So make sure and fill that out completely. Talk just a little bit about legumes and grazing system, although I don't need to after Mr. Hall's talk. He did a great job showing the, the benefits of legumes and grazing systems. They're going to take nitrogen from the air. Remember the air we're breathing is what percent nitrogen? 78, very good. 78% nitrogen, and they're going to take that nitrogen that in the, that's in the gaseous form, not available to the plant, and turn it into something that's available and can be shared with the plant. And it does it in that symbiotic relationship with rhizobium bacteria. And these are actually the nodules on the legume root here. The pink in the nodules indicates that the nodule is actively fixing nitrogen. And of course, legumes are going to tend to increase yields. They're going to provide higher forage quality and yield performance, as Mr. Hall told us. Um, we're going to see improved summer growth, especially from a deep taproot legume like alfalfa and Cerecia lespidiza. And then again, we dilute the endophyte. Um, so we're actually causing yield performance to be higher on toxic tall fescue if we include legumes. Not a perfect solution, but it does help. And then this is the value of that nitrogen fixed. And of course, our most aggressive nitrogen fixers, fixer is alfalfa, 150, 250 pounds. Um, and at a cost of 35 cents, you know it's going to be worth somewhere between 50 and $100 per acre in terms of nitrogen that it brings into our grazing system. Now, what's important to remember is that nitrogen from a legume plant to a grass plant is not directly shared. It, it's got to be shared indirectly through the grazing animal. So the animal is going to eat the clover plant and it's going to use some of the nutrients and then a lot of the nutrients are going to get expelled from the animal in dung and urine. And, um, and that's how we start that nutrient cycle and how that nitrogen gets shared between the legume plant and the grass plant. And then we have um, leaves that fall down or stems that fall down or trampled after grazing that are broken down and that nitrogen is released. But the point is, is that, that most of the nitrogen sharing that takes place is going to be indirect and it's going to be dependent upon the animal in a grazing system. Limited direct transfer. So we want to think about managing, how do we manage for legumes? And uh, we, we ideally want at least 20% legumes in pastures. 25 would be better, um, you know, up to around 40%. And that's a lot of legume when you look at a pasture. It will look like it's just legumes if you're at 40% legumes on a dry matter basis. 
Lime and fertilize according to soil tests. So what we want to do is create an environment in which these improved legumes like red clover and white clover can thrive within that pasture. And then we want to overseed legumes in late winter. Uh, this is a, a nice uh, mix here. We can do uh, six to eight pounds of red clover, a pound or two of ladino clover, and then 10 pounds of uh, annual lespedesia if you can get your hands on it. And that can be used to overseed pastures with in, in February and very early March. And the freezing and the thawing from the frost seeding will incorporate that um, seed into the soil. And it does not work as well for alfalfa and grasses. And then we want to rotationally stock our pastures. And you're probably saying, well, why do we care about rotational stocking? Well, as Ray showed yesterday, um, how we manage that grazing uh, can impact the botanical composition of that pasture. So how close and how frequently we graze that pasture can create an environment in which those legumes will have an advantage or disadvantage within that system. All right, use only adapted forage species. And we talked a lot about forage species yesterday, and I'll just review the basics. I'm not going to go through a lot of forage species. But number one on the list of characteristics to look for is you, you want it to be adapted to where you're trying to grow it. Adapted to the region and then to the soils that you're trying to grow it in. So alfalfa is a great forage, but, but it's not for a river bottom where it stays wet half the year. It can't stand those wet feet. So we need to, to make sure that where we're trying to grow that forage, that uh, the soils are adapted also. And these, are again, are just the growth curves of some of the adapted forage species that we have. When we've got cool season grasses and warm season grasses. And you can kind of see here how they would fit together nicely into a grazing system. We have a bimodal forage distribution here, a hump in the spring, hump in the fall. Uh, of growth in the fall with our cool season grasses like uh, bluegrass and orchard grass and fescue. If we go down here to the bottom to our warm season grasses, all that growth is concentrated right in the middle of the summer months. And that would fit nicely together into a grazing system as we talked about yesterday. So let's just talk a little bit about grazing management. And, and grazing management is really about helping these guys make the right decision when it comes to grazing. Sometimes they don't make the right decision if you leave them uh, do their own grazing management. So again, rotational grazing, um, what we're doing with rotational grazing is we're managing the residual leaf area. So um, like Ray and Mr. Hall talked about how close we graze that plant down. If we graze it all the way to the soil surface, we remove that ability of the plant to capture sunlight and regrow. Um, so we want to leave some residual leaf area. Four to five inches for cool season grasses would be, would be ideal and will allow that pasture to regrow very quickly. Um, so we want to really leave plenty of leaf area. The second thing we manage with rotational stocking is carbohydrate reserves in the plant. And we do that by resting plants between grazing events. So we want to allow that plant to rest, regain its leaf area, recharge its carbohydrates wherever it's storing them in the stem base or in the root system of the plant or in the rhizome or the solon. It, and that's going to allow that plant to grow faster after the next defoliation event takes place. And then we can use that rotational grazing to manage botanical composition. So if I had, say, a mixture of white clover and um, orchard grass in my pasture, and my orchard grass, I mean, my white clover was starting to take over, what could I do to, to promote orchard grass growth? You got to answer this question to pass the grazing school. What could I do? We could raise our grazing height, right? So if we raise our grazing height, we tend to favor that tall growing grass within that mixture. Grazing management's a powerful tool when it comes to managing botanical composition of pastures. How close and how frequently we graze that pasture can impact what species are dominant within that sward. So that's really important to understand. Just talk a little bit about implementing rotational stocking. And, and um, the, the first thing on my list is you have to go into it with the right attitude. Don't, don't do it because Ray told you to do it or Jimmy told you to do it or your NRCS guy told you to do it. If you go into rotational stocking or rotational grazing and say, well, this is never going to work, what's the chances of you being successful? Pretty slim, right? 
you're going to have problems and, and you're going to have roadblocks and droughts and floods and so forth. But if you have the right attitude, you kind of find your way around those roadblocks. No two seasons are ever going to be the same. Um, when we talk about implementing controlled grazing, water's key, as Jeff talked about this morning. So getting it in the right place, having it, water that allows, that's going to allow you to subdivide and manage those pastures. Without water in the right place, it's very hard to implement rotational stocking. And then again, we're managing residual height and rest period, and that's going to improve not only the productivity of that pasture, and we talked a little bit about the impact on you know, performance, but also the drought tolerance of that pasture. We don't talk enough about that, but one of the first benefits people see when they switch from a continuous to a rotational stocking system is that their pastures grow longer into a drought and come out of that drought faster. And the reason is, is that what we do to the top of that plant impacts what's below the ground. So if we abuse the top of that plant constantly, we're going to have a very small root system. And that root system is going to be much more susceptible to drought stress. If we go into that drought with a strong, healthy root system and, and lots of stored carbohydrates in that plant, that plant is going to be able to weather that drought much better. Um, again, we improve nutrient cycles with rotational stocking um, because we're getting a better nutrient distribution within our pastures. And then... Um, we're managing, we can manage botanical composition with grazing too. Now, people get kind of stuck on having to move animals every two days or three days or four days. And, and there's really too much emphasis placed on that. Ideally, we'd be moving animals a couple times a week would be the ideal situation. But if you work off the farm, and you want to move animals on Sundays, then you need to set your system up so that you move them on Sundays after church. So that system has got to meet your wants and needs. And, and um, one thing that I stress when we think about setting a grazing system up is don't go out and put a bunch of permanent fence in. You, you want to make sure that what you're putting in is going to work for you first. And that temporary fencing and temporary water can really help you do that. You want to make sure that you build flexibility into your grazing system. So when you put a watering system in, don't put it in for what you want to do next month. Put it in for what you want to do next year or in two years or three years or four years down the road. So it's really important that you think of ahead and build flexibility into that watering system so that you can intensify your management if you so desire in the future. Okay. I can't remember how many more slides I have, but we'll wrap it up pretty quick here. So just uh, mentioned weed control and pastures, and I'm not the weed control guy. Um, Dr. Green is our weed control specialist. But, but I will mention that what, what is a weed in a pasture? Yeah, that's exactly right. That's the definition I like. You know, if I can't get a cow to eat it, then, then that's the weed in my pasture, right? So um, a lot of weeds can actually be fairly high in nutritional value when they're young. So, and they're like any plant, as a forage plant matures or as a weed matures, it becomes less palatable and um, lower in, in forage quality. So, um, weeds are what I call a species of opportunity. So, often we blame the weeds for taking our pasture over, but really they're a symptom of another problem in most cases. Could be poor soil fertility, could be poor grazing management. But, but somehow we're making a space in that pasture, and in that space a weed is growing. I call it the good Lord's mandate. He won't let there be a space long in a pasture without something growing on it. And, and normally it's a weed, unfortunately. And again, like pasture renovation, we really need to think about weed control and pastures from an integrated approach. We need to think about why do we have those weeds? Is it our soil fertility? Is it our forage species that we chose? Um, is it the way we're managing our grazing within that pasture? And then the last thing on our, our list for weed control would be herbicide use. So usually that's the first thing on people's list. I get weeds in my pastures. I, I call the co-op. The co-op comes out and they spray some, some uh, herbicides in my pasture. And we've got some great pasture herbicides. There's no question about that. And, and they kill those weeds dead. And then what do I have left when I kill that weed? A bare spot. What grows in bare spots? So you can see if you don't have an integrated approach and attack that problem of why you have those weeds in the first place, it's kind of like a revolving door. And I'm just going to jump over this one here. Um, 
and I'll mention that the, the best weed resource that you all have is working with your local extension agent um, to identify the weed, identify its life cycle, and then figure out what herbicide works and more important, in, as importantly, when that herbicide should be applied to get maximum control. All right, so this is my pasture renovation checklist. Um, we want to rest pastures after stresses. We want to soil test, soil test and adjust fertility. We want to choose adapted forage species, not just to the region, but also to the soil that we have on our farm. We want to implement rotational stocking. We want to control broadleaf weeds. And then we want to incorporate legumes into our grazing system. And then the last thing on my list is that if, if none of this works, you know, we can go in and do a complete renovation in our pastures. All right, is there any questions? Okay. <laughs> so um, do I have one minute? Or we'll just talk. So, so probably the, the most cost-effective way to overseed a legume, and that would include red and white clover, would be frost seeding in February. Frost seeding is simply broadcasting that seed on. You could do it with an ATV or a little spreader on the back of the tractor. You want to graze those pastures closely. You want to make sure your pH is where it should be. Uh, your, um, your fertilizer fertility levels are where they're supposed to be. And then broadcast that seed on. One mistake people make after they frost seed is that they take the animals off the pasture. And, and, um, and it's a mistake because it lets that sod grow up around those seedlings. And those seedlings that have just germinated, those little clover seedlings, are very susceptible for competition for light, nutrients, and water. And, and when they, that sod or those existing plants go around it, they can often cause a stand failure. The best thing you can do is leave animals on after you overseed those pastures and leave them on until they start to nip those little seedlings off. And then at that point, take them out and, um, and let those seedlings get about eight inches tall before you uh, come back into that pasture. That's right. So you'd feed some hay on those paddocks. No, I, I'd let them get up just high enough that the animals start to nip them off. Oh, okay. right. And then take them, take them, take that pasture out of rotation until your seedlings are about, you know, eight inches tall, and then you can put it back in rotation. So, yeah, so, so the question is, is, is it going to hurt germination? Actually, um, you know, the hoof action can actually help incorporate seed into the soil. So, um, and they're going to stomp some of those seedlings, and they'll, they'll kill some of the seedlings when you leave them on there, but the alternative is, is that sod gets around those seedlings and they all die. If there's a lot of bare soil, then you're going to get good cross-action bearing seed. Until the drill works well, the cross city works so well with covers, then why not go that easy way? Probably get an 80-90% stand compared to no till drill. Uh, but if you don't get it in during the frost time here in February, like February, early March, then you use a no till drill. Or obviously, if you're going to do any kind of overseeding in the late summer or fall, if no frost happens then, you're going to have to use a no till drill to the existing Did 